If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel low. All right, Cornerstone, good morning. Get up on your feet. Our God is alive, amen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that again. Our God is alive, amen. 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 All right, hey, let's let, let's sing. Our God will reign forever, and all the world will. Know name everyone together sing a song of the redeemed sing it our God will reign our God will reign forever and all the world will know his name and everyone together Song of the Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what He did. My Savior, my Savior lives. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, You are the only way. My Savior. come from heaven and darkness trembles at his name victory forever is the song of the redeemed yeah. come on sing it out. I know that my redeemer lives and now I stand on what he did my savior my savior lives to say, Jesus, you are the only way, my Savior, my Savior lives, come on, see my Savior, my Savior lives, my Savior lives, my Savior lives. chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way, my Savior, my Savior lives. Come on, sing it in. I know. I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what He did, my Savior, my Savior lives. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way, my Savior, my Savior lives. Amen. He's alive. Isn't that exciting? We should be pumped up about that. Our God is alive. Amen. Uh, hey, so um, I, had a, I had a bit of insomnia last night. I, I couldn't sleep. And uh, naturally, you know, you, you know one, one thing you do when, uh, uh, when, when you get insomnia, you jump on your phone, right? Could, because you can't sleep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on Facebook. Uh, one thing, I, I, I'm glad I did it. it, was, it this one thing made it worth it. And this one thing, it was, uh, 
it was a post that um, uh, a kid that I that I kind of helped jump into to worship leading back, back back in Kentucky. He posted this, and this kid's been going through a lot in his life. He's lost his, his identity. Uh, he he's lost who who he is, and, and and to and to hear him say this, he 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 said this one thing, in the Bible. God says I am 18 times and then, and then he goes on to describe what I am all 18 times and what, and, and what was awesome is that after, after he said that he said you, you need to know whose you are in order to know who you are our God is the God of the universe he is the king he is the creator of everything our God is the beginning and the end, and we are His. Our lives are not our own. Our lives are His. So that, that's what this song is about. That's, that's what we're going to sing. From the depths, from the heights, I will be a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry. I will be a sacrifice. I will be a sacrifice. Let me down, sing it out. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Oh, hand on my heart, this much is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down, lay me down. Giving up all my rights Take this light and let it shine, shine, shine Take this light and let it shine I lay me down, I'm not my own I belong to you alone
Amen. Good morning, y'all. You ever, you ever heard that, y'all? Good morning. Hey, we're so glad you're here. Gosh, it's going to be an, an awesome day. If you're a guest with us, welcome to Cornerstone. Uh, you can stop by at the Nexus booth to check out a gift that we've got for you. Um, as we continue this service, there's a lot of people in this room. Why don't you walk around the room and say hi to somebody. Uh, find a new face that you haven't seen before. Welcome to Cornerstone this morning. Okay. Thank you for being a warm and friendly fo bunch of people. That's a, I, I don't even apologize for having to interrupt all this. So you can come on back and find your place. And uh, don't forget, you can also hug and shake and kiss and all that afterwards too. So a uh, couple of things that we want you to be aware of. First of all, in case you've been locked in the root cellar all week long and you haven't heard, we're having a congregational vote after second service. And the proposal is to call Joe Camp to be our lead pastor. So you'll want to come back for that if you're a member. If you're not a member, you can attend the meeting, but you won't be able to vote. So that's the first thing on the deal. And then tomorrow night, we begin our vacation Bible school. And cookies will always be necessary for Vacation Bible School. That's in Second Hesitations 3.3. Thou shalt not have VBS without cookies. So uh, if you got cookies to bring, bring them with you. We'd love to have more cookies. We started an on, we're going to start an online Bible study of the book of Ruth tomorrow. And uh, where is she? This lady right here. Uh, Jessica Pape. Jessica Pape. I, I took two of those stupid ginkgo pills today. <laughs> it didn't work. Anyway, Jessica's uh, on the forefront of that. And she told me they have like 20 people that are joined in that community for uh, the study on Ruth. It's not too late if you'd like to be a part of that. There's information in the bulletin on that. Uh, the Next to the last thing is Church in the Park on the 26th. Scotty, did we get our signs? Not yet. Okay. Next Sunday... Or you're going to be hanging, you'll just be out there on the street saying, hey, hey. Uh, we got signs coming, and we want you to, uh, first 20 families, stop by the information booth next Sunday. Pick one up, plant it in your yard. We want to make everybody in our community know that something's happening at Cornerstone. It's going to be a great day. We'll have only one service out there at 1030, and then we'll uh, finish with our all-church picnic. It'll be great. You don't want to miss it. It's a long time in the future, but on November, uh, what are the dates, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, there will be a terrific, uh, I can't even think of the right adjective, it's, it's the finest opportunity to enrich your marriage that I have encountered in almost 45 years of working in this field. It's called Weekend to Remember. I don't care if you've been married 60 years, you could go to Weekend to Remember and enrich your marriage. If you're engaged, it'd be maybe the smartest wedding gift you could give your future spouse. I have taken couples who were on the brink of breaking their marriage up, and it helped restore their marriage and bring it back from the edge. I want you to go with me. Debbie and I are going to go, and I want you to join us. So mark your calendars. It's in the, in the program, and... Uh, call me or catch me if you want more information about that. Uh, we're going to receive our offering, and we think it's a, <laughs> what a great opportunity to give back to God what he's already given to us to steward and use. So if the folks that are going to do that will step forward, I'll offer a prayer, and, and uh, we'll join together in this act of worship. Heavenly Father, thank you. You meet our needs, and you go so beyond our basic needs. Uh, thank you for that. And it's just a reminder of your provision. Now, uh, we return to you a part of what you have given us. You don't need our money, but we need this opportunity to remind ourselves of whose this money is. And so we return it to you grateful and really happy, joyful. And because we know you'll continue to meet our needs. And through these offerings, you'll do things not just here, but around the world to bring people to know Jesus. 
we are grateful for this. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You notice in a, a, a theme this morning, he's alive. Uh, so the, we, we learned this song last week, and uh, uh, this song talks about what, what we talked about this morning, that, that we're, we're not our own. We are who God says we are. We are only who we are because God is who he is. You know, like, like I said, in order to know who we are, we need to know whose we are. And again, this, this song just, just, just screams that out. So sing this together.
We just sing about we have a place in your house. We have a place in your heart. We have a place in, in your kingdom. And I pray that you show us that. Through what, what we're about to talk about in, in Ephesians, I, I pray that, that we can see that path that you have for us to your house, to your arms, to your heart. I see. I pray that we see that. God, I pray, I pray that we hear these words with open hearts, open minds, and open ears, and we can just soak these words in. I love you so much, God. Thank you for everything you've given us in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't you have a seat? Huh? Dallas, Texas, Dallas, Texas. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How you, do, how you doing, Jerry Jones? <laughs> hey, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> no! <laughs> yes, sir, thank you so much. Yes, sir. How you doing? Oh, I appreciate you. I appreciate you so much. Oh. <laughs> we don't rock, boy. We don't rock, boy. I'm telling you, boy. For real, bro. For real, bro. I love you, boy. I love you, too. I appreciate you so much. Thank you, sir. All right, now. <laughs> Good job, man. Okay. There is just something so moving about seeing a newly minted multimillionaire cry in public, right? That if you're an NFL fan, you're probably familiar with what happens on draft day, and these guys get the call. I never got the call. Big surprise. Uh, I had a similar experience, uh, basically in reverse, where this goes back to the bad old days when uh, we would have math bees and spelling bees in grade school. Anybody remember that? You know the dance, right? The two brightest kids, teachers' pets, would be the captains, and they would pick, you know, one after yeah, taking turns until they got down to that last person that neither of them wanted. No, you take him. Oh, no, no, you take him. No, you, you really, you take him. No. And then the teacher had to arbitrate and give me to the team that she thought that could stand my, you know, I, I don't know, brain dead, whatever. But uh, uh, those days are, are long gone, thank you. But I hated that. I don't spell well and I can't do math. Uh, don't want to, don't make me. So anyway, but we're going to talk about that process a little bit today from the fourth chapter of Ephesians. So if you have your Bible, you want to turn there, it'll be on the screen, beginning in verse 1. We're, we're going to just take a slice. It would take me so long to go all the way through the book of Ephesians. I would love to, but uh, we just don't have the time. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. As a prisoner for the Lord... 
I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Let's talk about what that looks like and what that might mean to us. First of all, we need to not get the cart before the horse. You don't get worthy in order to get your calling, right? And some people have misunderstood that. You get called not because of your goodness and not because of your worthiness. You get called because of his goodness. You can't get good enough to get called. We talked about that back in chapter 2. You're saved by grace through faith. This is on the basis of how good God is. And once we say yes to his grace on his terms, God puts us in a relationship with himself. And then he gives us abilities and powers beyond our own strength to make it possible for us to live a life worthy of that calling. And Paul talks about some specific behaviors and attributes that are connected to that the behaviors and attributes that are part of living a life worthy of our calling. When I was in uh, junior high, back before there was such a thing as middle school, uh, in Stillwater, Oklahoma, they had one team in the Little League system that year after year after year was always the best team. They were just dominant. They were Murphy's Yanks. Murphy's was a hardware store downtown, and Murphy's Yanks had the Yankees pinstripes for uniforms, right? And you didn't, they didn't just do this lottery where they drew kids' names out of a hat. Coaches got together, and they picked their team. And the coach for Murphy's Yanks always picked the best players. And once you got picked, you would go over to the coach's house for a hot dog roast, and once you finished the hot dogs, then he would give a little pep talk, and then he presented each boy with their uniform. And clean, neat, pressed, and folded New York Yankees uniforms. He would put them in the kids' hands, and he'd say, now play like a Yank. Well, that's a little bit what happened when Jesus called us, except we didn't try out for this team. He didn't put us on his team because... We were just that good. Anybody here feel like they are just that good? I don't think any of us do. You don't try out. You get chosen. We were chosen because of the goodness of God, not because of our goodness. And now we live a life worthy of that calling. See, playing like a Yankee is about living up to the uniform. And maybe the best news I've got of all this morning is that you don't have to do this on your own. When you said yes to Jesus on his terms, he put his spirit, the Holy Spirit, in you. And the Holy Spirit is working in each one of us to whatever degree we permit him to make us worthy, to make us live in a worthy manner. He wants to And he keeps working at it so that we can live in a a manner worthy of the calling that we've received. See, if this was just about you and me pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and being just that strong-willed and just that good, we'd all be toast. There is no way anybody can be that good. Can anybody measure up purely on the basis of their willpower? I don't think so. Let's go back and look at the idea of calling. That's a pretty big idea. We don't have to guess what uh, that calling is. God told us. My favorite place where God talks about the calling is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, following that very famous verse, 28, where it says, and we know that God is at work in everything for the good of those that are called according to his purpose. And then he goes on to say in verse 29 and 30, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Now I want to look at this in a sequential form because I think it can help us figure it out. The first thing is foreknowledge. For those he foreknew. 
Now, foreknowledge, it just means what you might think, knowing beforehand. It's to have knowledge before something happens. There are so few things in life that we actually have foreknowledge on. Have you noticed that? Uh, I did not know before I met Debbie Smith that she would eventually become my wife. Now, you know, seconds after I met her, I decided I wanted that. And for me, it kind of became a foregone conclusion. But that's not foreknowledge, right? Because I didn't know what she was thinking. And she had a lapse of judgment and said yes. And so <laughs> the story worked out pretty good. But that foregone conclusion is not foreknowledge. Uh, God knows the end at the beginning, and he knows it perfectly. I believe that before he spun the planets into space, he knew your complete story. Everybody from Adam on in all of time, God knew their story. Now, that, a human can't do that. Thankfully, God's not human. He's big enough that he can do that for knowledge. He knew before. And the reason he can do that is because of what theologians and philosophers call omniscience. God is omniscient, meaning he knows everything, all-knowing. Uh, he knows perfectly everything about our lives. And I think that's pretty big. So, okay, so uh, come up out of the philosophical weeds a little bit and realize God knew beforehand. He knew that you would or would not say yes to Jesus before, in fact, before you ever came on the scene. His, his foreknowledge is the first thing, the sequence, and then comes predestination. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. Now, Sometimes people make the mistake of equating foreknowledge and predestination. And I think that's a mistake because foreknowledge is knowing beforehand. Foreknowledge doesn't involve causation. In other words, foreknowing is not causative. You, you don't cause something to happen by your foreknowledge. You only know it's going to happen. Predestination, to be predestined, now we're talking about cause. And predestination, to be predestined, means you are headed, you are given a predetermined destination. It's predetermined by God. And I think that's pretty big. I mean, uh, he knew and then he caused. Okay. The question then is, what has God predestined about those he knew would say yes to his grace? You can look at predestination in a lot of different ways. And I'm not on a campaign for one way or the other. I'm just saying God had a predetermined destination for us. And we don't have to wonder what that destination is. In verse 29 of Romans 8, he says, He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God's predetermined outcome for us who have said yes to him is that we would conform to the image of his son. And essentially what that means is that we would become like Jesus. This conforming process is very interesting to me and it calls to my mind uh, the images of a sculptor or a potter. Uh, they start with the raw materials and then with the tools, with their creativity, with uh, time, they create what they had an image of in their mind, and it becomes visible and real. Um, <clears throat> some things take minutes to do. Some t things take years. Michelangelo's Pieta, I don't know if you've ever seen this picture, but uh, I think it's, it is one of the most emotion-evoking pictures I've ever seen, sculptures I've ever seen. On my bucket list is to see it for, uh, in person. But anyway, uh, that didn't happen in a week. Now, the mug I bought at Disneyland for 15 bucks, that probably happened in five minutes, right? It's no big deal. But s some things take a lot longer. There, there is no such thing as an instant masterpiece. The actual Pieta that Michelangelo sculpted out of a slab of marble took him two years of more or less constant work. Uh, I'm... I'm 65, and God has been hacking away at me for 65 years, and he's way not done yet. 
We talked about this, Scotty talked about this a couple of weeks ago when he preached from uh, chapter two. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. It, we're not coffee cups, we're masterpieces. So that's big. So, so what's the calling? Well, the calling is simply that we would be like Jesus. Anybody made it there yet? Maybe the, I think a much better question is, are you becoming more like Jesus? See, I think when I cooperate with the master, I can fulfill my calling incrementally. That's what sanctification is. That's a big theological word. But because when I cooperate with God, with the master, as he crafts my life, I'm living worthy of the calling. And Paul, back to Ephesians 4 now, gives us some ways to measure that, some things we can get our hands around. He says in verse 2, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's a lot of information there, and I'm just going to, kind of hit the tops of it all so let's unpack it a little here first be completely humble I love what C.S. Lewis said about humility he said humility is not thinking less of yourself it's thinking of yourself less I like that when I was a young guy in ministry in my early 20s one of my mentors in Oklahoma City gave uh, the maybe uh, as good a definition of humility as I think there is. He said, humility is knowing what you're good at and being glad to do it when it's appropriate. I think that's pretty slick. It makes me think about uh, the pastor was driving home from church with his wife one morning after church and he uh, driving along and he says, you know, Mrs. Whitby told me this morning that she thinks I'm one of the great preachers of our generation. And he paused, and his wife just looked straight ahead. And he said, so how many truly great preachers do you think there are in our generation? And the wife looked straight ahead and said, one less than you do. <laughs> <laughs> humility has a shadow. And the shadow is false humility. You know, you've been around this. Oh, I, no, I couldn't do that. I, no, I'm not good enough for that. Which basically, the way you translate that is, ask me three or four more times and I'll do it. Well, humility's antithesis, its opposite, is pride. And actually, I think I can make a pretty good case for the fact that false humility has its roots in pride. But Paul isn't talking about those kinds of humility, obviously. He, in fact, he's talking about a kind of humility that doesn't show up very often. Did you notice that he said, he didn't just say be humble. He said be completely humble. See, the bar is way high on this. How do you get completely humble? Uh, that's a pretty long and hard process, but I think there may be a couple of things that can help us with this. Uh, the first one is through the counsel of wise friends. You've got to go out on a limb. It is a big risk to ask somebody to evaluate your humility because what they give you as input might be really hard to hear. It might even be humiliating. I heard a guy one time say, humiliation is the root of all humility. I don't know that that's absolutely true, but I can tell you from my own life, boy, if I don't humble myself, God in life has a way of humiliating me. And then I get the choice. Either I can step into humility or I can resist that in pride. Well, then it becomes the root of more pridefulness. Be completely humble and gentle. Um, have you noticed that people who are truly humble are generally gentle? When you know who you are well enough that you're not having to defend yourself and you're not preoccupied with thinking about yourself all the time, that frees you up to think about other people and what you could do to contribute into the welfare and the good of somebody else's life. And because you're growing in humility, 
you're likely to treat others with the same care and gentleness that you'd like to be treated with. Humble people are able to apply grace and humility then produces gentleness in people of grace. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'm a patient person, but... And you know what that means, right? They lost, they're done. They have reached the limit of their patience. Well, here's the problem for a lot of us. We, the journey from I'm patient to not impatient is really short. It's sometimes, you know, just right after the first annoyance. Patience, well, I don't think I have to give this big, parsed out, philosophical definition of patience. You know what patience is. Everybody here does. So instead of parsing it out, I just kind of ask a couple of questions. How patient are you? Are you satisfied that you're patient enough? Ouch. There are some things that get in the way of my patience. And the first thing is fatigue. When I am tired, I am not patient. You can ask Debbie. You can ask our kids. You can ask anybody that's close to me. When I'm tired, I'm not patient. And when I'm impatient, you can probably ask me, did you get any sleep last night? The second thing is hurry. When I'm in a hurry... I really struggle with patience. If I'm in a hurry, I don't have time to be patient, right? I want what I want right now, not later. And to have patience, I gotta be willing to wait until later. I need, I need it. Well, I feel I need it, and I don't wanna slow down for it. You know, it would be worth your time to contemplate what deems your patience. What gets in the way of your patience? I think the queen mother of all the things that get in the way of patience in my life and maybe in yours is pride. Nothing gets in the way of patience for me like my pride. I, I find that people who are completely humble and gentle are generally patient as well. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. You've had to bear with somebody else. I mean, that's just, there's nothing new about that. If you, if, from the time you were little, you had to bear with people. But there's a lot of us that don't bear with one another in love. We bear with them in resentment. We bear with them, but we're not happy about it. We slow down and wait for them, but we're not happy about it. You know what? If you had started earlier, I wouldn't have to wait. If you had done your homework, I would have. If you had practiced, I wouldn't have. If you quit thinking about all those other things. Were just, and then the, the big one is, if you had only done it the way I told you to do it. Pause here for a minute. This profile that we're drawing, completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love, that creates a very attractive profile. Um, and I want you to think about, is there anybody in your life that fits that profile? Well, nobody's perfect at it, but there are some who are better than others. Do you find it hard to hang out with them? Do you avoid them, or do you look for reasons to hang with them? I, Completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with others in love. Anybody not want to hang out with that kind of person? Anybody not want to be that kind of person? What if, what if the church was populated with people like that? What if the church was populated with people who are completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love? You think we'd have a platform to influence our community? You think we'd have lots of empty seats? Lots of things going on that nobody comes to? Just a thought. Well, that's nice and all, but you know what? That, that's, <laughs> that kind of person is going to get run over. They're, they're just soft. They're not going to make it to the first coffee break at my job, right? 
I have discovered, and you think about this for yourself, but the people that I know that fit that category are tough people. It, it, a weenie can't get this done. Where'd that come from? Uh, somebody who is just going to lay down and let the train run over. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about somebody who has strength of character enough to do these things that are not natural. Completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. That's not the end of the profile. Paul goes on and he says in verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Now he goes from individual life to corporate life. There is nothing more important to our enemy Satan than fracturing the unity of the church. Any church, every church, Cornerstone Community Church. Big Grand Canyon fractures, little microscopic ones. He wants everything. Every kind of break with unity that he can do. He wants them all and he plans to leverage them all. He has a plan for you. He's not just making this up as he goes along. When division shows up in a church, all kinds of bad stuff happens. Now, do we have to agree completely on everything? Every single point? No. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about a church where there's only one opinion, where there is one enforced preference. That's not what he's talking about. I think the unity of the Spirit is about us learning how to want what the Spirit wants. It's about us learning to want what God wants. He's not left us to figure out what he wants just by intuition. We have 66 books in the Bible that tell us how he is, who he is, what he wants, how he acts. And learning to want what God wants starts there. It doesn't start with your favorite TV preacher or your favorite author. Or It starts with the source. It starts with the Bible, with his word. And if you're not in the Bible, if you're not in his word, how can you know who he is, how he is, and what he wants? Find out about that. You go to the source. Not just the parts that you like. You know what I'm talking about? It's easy to cherry pick. I'm talking about the whole enchilada. I, I'm not saying this as a as a boast, I'm just telling you, I make myself, I don't have to make very hard, but I read the Bible through every year in a systematic way because I don't want to lose touch with the entirety of what God has given us about himself and about life and about, well. Now, Paul didn't write, create the unity of the Spirit. Well, let me go back. When we do our best to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, we've got to want what God wants more than we want what we want. And that is no small thing. That's where the rub comes for every single one of us. You know, church is split over preference. My dad was in ministry for 55, 60 years, and uh, he has story after story about churches that split over the color of the carpet. You know that old story about the church wanted to install a chandelier and a guy got up in the meeting and said, I, we, I'm again it. I'm again it for lots of reasons. Number one, it's too expensive. And number two, nobody here knows how to play a chandelier. <laughs> the church is split over preference. Paul didn't write create the unity of the spirit. He said keep the unity of the spirit. See, this isn't something that we made happen. We don't own the unity of the spirit. We steward it. We keep it, and that's a big thing. Frankly, sometimes keeping the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace is really hard work and way messy sometimes because people are messy. You have to go out of your way to keep the unity of the Spirit sometimes, and that means you have to get out of your comfort zone. That's why Paul wrote, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There will be effort. Now think about this. Does it seem like it would be outside the realm of reason that somebody who is completely humble, gentle, patient, bears with others in love, that they would 
make effort to maintain, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In my mind, that's the very kind of person who will make the effort. Others would give up. You know, we're having a vote after second service uh, to call Joe Camp to be our next lead pastor. Um, God's given us a really very special gift, an opportunity here to be able to choose who will be our next lead guy. And uh, at the same time, we have an enemy who would like to do nothing more than divide and conquer Cornerstone Community Church through disunity over the selection process. Okay, now I'm talking, just talking family talk here, and I'm kind of getting into it. I, I can tell you that the elders and the staff and the selection uh, or search team that we brought in on this process have done their due diligence through prayer, hours of prayer, through uh, discussion, hours of discussion and research and chasing down references. And we feel very confident that Joe Camp can help lead Cornerstone to the next level of its influence in Delaware County, of, it, of us reaching farther toward our noble objective of helping people know the love of Christ. We believe that Joe and his family can find a home here where they will grow up. Uh, somebody who'll be here for the long haul. This is exactly one of the things that in our conversations with Joe, he expressed. They are looking for a place where they can raise their kids. They're not looking for a short-term stopgap. They're looking for a long-term ministry. Now, I know that you've got less information than you probably want. You've only heard Joe preach once, and then you've got the recommendation of the search committee and the elders, and that's it. But I'm trusting that we have all been praying for a long time now that God will guide us to the way of wisdom on this selection decision. And all I want to do this morning is to urge us to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace throughout this whole process. Because really, no matter who we install as our lead pastor, without the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, we don't stand a ghost of a chance at reaching our mission of helping people know the love of Christ. Heavenly Father, you're um, so good to us to put in your word to us all the things we need. And we needed what you had there this morning. So now we trust you, God, to do in us and with us and for us what is most wise, best for your family. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you'll want to get back after second service and uh, join us for the vote. Stand where you are and turn to somebody and say, you got to be back here. <laughs>